Hello and welcome to the Child Psych Podcast. My name is Tammy Shamoon and today I have Julie King and Joanna with us to talk about some of their work and how to get our kids listening. We need our kids listening. Every parent needs their kids listening. So thank you so much. We're going to dive into some great creative strategies when our kids give us pushback and how we still stay connected during these really hard moments. I got three kids and there is fighting in our house and it's always, always in need of some tips and tricks. And I think all, all parents are. Um, so welcome. Just so honored to have both of you agreed to come on the podcast today. Thank, Thank you. you for having us. And it's yeah. good to hear there's fighting in your house because that's how you know your kids are alive. Oh, yeah. I was like, they're, you know, you can't have ying without yang. I was like, they love each other. But of course, you know, I've got the six-year-old, the eight-year-old, and the 15-year-old. And it's usually conflicts around the six and eight-year-old because they're so close in age. Mm. Um, but, you know, I always think of conflict as opportunity for growth and how to reconnect and how to make repairs. And I think that's what I really love about your books. It's very much a focus of moving away from punishment and how, how to really look at how to teach your kids problem solving and how to stay connected during hard moments and not how to use fear and coercion um, during difficult parenting moments, which unfortunately often is kind of what happens. Our families are taught that we use fear and control in mm. order to get what we need done as parents. But that comes at a cost to kids' psychology and to their mental health and the parents' mental health. So we just love your book. Well, there's two of your books. I have one of them with me right now. Uh, the f now the f <laughs> in, let's go in order here. So the first one is that you wrote was how to talk so little kids will listen. Right, that was the first one. Yep. And your second book is how to talk when kids won't listen. Correct, I got it right. Mm -hmm. Yep. Beautiful. So what I love, it's very, anyone listening, their books are very practical. Like if parents are like, what do I do when this happens? Like they've got an illustration for that. They've got dialogue for how to navigate that. And I think parents, with how crazy the world is right now and how stressed parents are, they need practical, right? They don't want a little bit of the psychology is great, but your books are just very hands-on. And I found that, you know, these were probably one of, I don't know, this might be the most practical parenting book next to no drama discipline that I've seen with such like though your book and no drama discipline are just so concrete and so easy and actionable. You very actionable. It's a very actionable yeah. books yeah. because it can Thank be hard you. to take theory and figure out how to put it into practice. Okay. So we have some theory, but what do you actually say in the moment? That's what we're, that's what we're trying to do in our books. So, yeah. so I'm glad that it worked for you. Yeah. So, you know, whether it's about sibling disputes or homework, it could be really frustrating where kids aren't listening. And then we use, you know, parents. I mean, I'm guilty of that using threats, like when the kids won't listen. I'm pretty sure we just came back for our honeymoon. And I'm pretty sure one of my threats was if you don't clean your room, then we're not going to Mexico. That did not go over well. <laughs> <laughs> Let me tell you, that did not go over well with my highly sensitive eight-year-old. So I know better, yet here I was using this threat because we're all stressed to get on the plane on time. Um, when parents have this, they, they're like resorting to punishing or yelling or, you know, co coercion. Where do you even start getting out of that pattern with kids? Like, Where would you guys tell parents to start if they're using that all the time, threats and screaming? <laughs> Okay, um, that's a broad question. So I'll try to start with a broad answer, which is that I think we want to start with focusing on the behavior and how to get the behavior we want, right? You know, how do we get the kid to clean that room? And, and that leads to, you know, coming up with a punishment, coming up with a threat, you know, and, and it's very understandable because we need that behavior. Um, so that's what we're focused on, but it's going to help if instead of focusing on the behavior, we think about what is going on for the kid at that moment. You know, why aren't they cleaning their room? Um, is it just too overwhelming and they don't know where to start? Are they, you know, in the middle of a video game and it's very engaging and they can't quite stop? Did they just have a fight with their older sister and they're in a bad mood? 
Um, so, you know, there may ha be some problem having nothing to do with cleaning the room. And if we don't know where that, what that problem is, our threats are only going to upset the kid. And, you know, frankly, you're not going to cancel those plane tickets. Um, you're probably just going to have a kid with a meltdown. Um, you know, so if it turns out that, that the, the cleanup is overwhelming and the kid doesn't know where to start, then we might help them with that. You know, well, let's, you know, let's make a game of it. Let's turn on some music and see if we can pick up all the laundry and throw it in the hamper by the end of the first song. Now you have a good feeling. You have a cooperative kid. Um, you know, you've solved a problem. Instead of threatening a punishment, making your kid cry, you probably can't follow through on it because it's non-refundable tickets. <laughs> but but that's our basic rule is we try to we try to back up a few steps and start with how is the kid feeling what's going on in their head instead of starting with trying to get the behavior. So what I'm hearing is be curious about what might be going on here. It's it's kind of like when you do I'm a in a past lifetime I was a couples therapist mm -hmm. and I always would tell couples you're not fighting about the dishwasher. Like mm. chances are, you know, something happened that day or there was a rupture in your relationship and we have to stay curious as to what might be going on for that person, what's going on for you. And that's what I'm hearing. I'm hearing you say, be curious about what might this be about. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, I think of it as there's a connection between how people feel and how people behave. And we tend to focus on the behavior when we're looking at our kids. But if we think for ourselves, when do we, we when are we not our best selves as parents, right? I mean, you just told us, I yelled at them and threatened them about going to Mexico when I knew we we're going to go, right? Like, what was going on for you? I'm just going to guess, even though I wasn't there in your body, in your house, <laughs> that you were feeling really anxious about making the plane and about getting everything done before you had to go and ha leaving the house in some sort of semblance of order so when you came back, it wasn't in chaos. You know, and probably there were details about the wedding and the, and the and, you know, all the things that were going on in your head about the planning and, uh-oh, there's, uh, there's this obstacle in our way to getting to the airport. My kid's not doing what I need him to do. But you felt stressed about it, right? Mm -hmm. Probably in, on another day when things were calm and there was no time pressure and there wasn't a wedding to try to get to, you would have handled it differently, right? Oh, yeah. I, I was a mess for three days until the wedding happened. Um, <laughs> and of course, then my kids are perfect angels once the yep. wedding happened, but they kids pick up on our stuff too. So what I'm hearing is just that reflection parents need to pause and say, you know, is my reaction coming from my own stress and my own life circumstances? And, you know, sometimes really small things cast a really big shadow when we have things going on. For us. Yeah, we, we like to say that, you know, kids can't act right when they don't feel right. Mm. And people can't act right when they don't feel right. You know, such as ourselves, even grownups. So, you. so we, we start with the feeling and we move from there. And it kind of seems like the long way around. You know, it seems more direct to just say, you know, get this, the next time I walk down this hall, the room better be clean or else. But you know, sometimes the longer way actually turns out to be the shorter way, because when everybody feels better, they feel cooperative and things get done and then the stress goes down. OK, so let's just roll with this. Let's let's okay. it, let's let's dissect that interaction with my daughter. That's fun. Let's do that. <laughs> I'm sure she'll look back on this one day and say, Mom, why did you do that? Um <laughs> So obviously my reaction about my daughter, not her room is a disaster and like there's clothes everywhere. And I'm like, we need to like, we got to go, got to go on this, you know, this trip. And, um, I'm coercing her, like basically threatening her. And that obviously is not a good idea. I know better. It's not my proudest parenting moment, but let's just air this all out to everybody who listens. What would you say based on your, your books, your work, what could I have done differently in that moment? Let's just make a guinea pig out of me. Well, I, I'm torn. We could go in two directions. I can give you some ideas, but it really would help me to know why you wanted her to clean it up. 
So tell me, can you, can you tell me that first? Oh yeah. I would say it was, we knew we had house sitters coming and I didn't want the house a mess because they're taking care of it. I had asked her several times to clean her room before that and she didn't obviously follow through with that. And we knew we had other things to get done and we couldn't move on until we had had this thing done because somewhere in that heaping pile of mess were her clothes she was taking to Mexico. <laughs> oh. <laughs> ah. <laughs> okay. Okay. And she's eight, right? Yes. So that gives me a little bit of a better understanding of where she might be coming from and why it, you, you care so much. Cause when you told me the story, I, I was making up my own reasons why it needed to be cleaned up, but they weren't the same as your reasons. And I'm not sure she would know either. Um, so let's think about what's going on for her. Well, actually, let me just ask you, why do you yeah. think she didn't clean up? Like she's, she was excited. Like there's overwhelm. There's, you know, a, a little angst. She's a little angsty. She's highly sensitive. If you guys are familiar with the term highly sensitive. So she's picking up on my feelings, my now husband's feelings, just everything. And she's kind of a messy kid anyway, if we're being honest, like it, it is what it is. Um, so that's not her default yeah. setting to keep a clean room in the first place, but yeah. And of course I'm the parent who's like, it's your room. Normally I give them space to keep their room like as is. And all of a sudden I'm asking like, you need to do this now. And normally I'm pretty much like, it's your room. It's fine. Keep it somewhat manageable. So I think maybe the, the expectations all of a sudden slapped her in the face and she's like, why do I need to do this now? Normally you don't like, you're not on me about my room. And all of a sudden I was on her about the room. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So that's where I would start is to acknowledge what was going on for her. This seems kind of odd, doesn't it? That I'm asking you to clean up your room. Normally I don't. Right. And let her, I would let her say, yeah, mom, like, what's the big deal? Why can't I just close the door? Right. <laughs> It just would be our norm. I, I'm a big fan of, so anyone listening, I'm a big fan of kids being able to keep their rooms. Like it's their room, it's their clothes, it's their things. So no, I don't usually, I'm not super huge on that. I mean, common spaces are one thing, but the rooms are another. So yeah, but yeah, this one. So, so, but if you said that to her, if you actually said, this might, this might seem kind of odd that I'm asking you to clean it up. And maybe you don't really like that idea because usually it's supposed to be your, your room, you decide. Then, and then here's the hard part as the parent, you pause and let her, you know, listen to what she has to say. And it sounds like she's going to say, yeah, I, you always say it's my room. I get to decide. Why do I have to clean up now? Why are you making such a big deal about it? Why can't, you know, why can't I just leave? The, I'll just close the door. Why do I have to clean it up? Absolutely. And she would have done really well with that hindsight. She's very, very communicative little, little girl. Yeah. Um, but, and Normally, I, we don't resort to punishments because that, we know that does not work for highly, especially highly sensitive children. Like they yeah. pick up on emotions too quickly and they get flooded very, very easily. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah. You and then have, you did have some reason that you gave me that because I was actually saying like, why are you making her? Because I did the same thing. It's your room. You know, we'll cut this. We'll shut the door. <laughs> but you said something about the house sitters. And I was like, is that a real reason? Or is that just like you're a little bit uncomfortable that they're going to see this? And I was like, yeah. Oh yeah. The perfectionist in me is like, we have company coming over essentially and they're going to see this mess. And yeah, I think I, I, you know, as a parent, we're just being, I've never done this in a podcast. I've never like aired this out being like, here's my parenting issues, guys. Yeah. I, I knew. And uh, then of course I reacted and she didn't listen because she was crying and it would not get done until what we would have done, which is what you should done is connect yeah. Yeah. and sit with her and let the big feelings happen and then well you also have a plane to catch though <laughs> so i'm gonna i know like move it forward so so once you give that pause and let your kids say whatever she says then you can acknowledge that say like oh so it doesn't even seem fair to you because it's like i'm changing the rules all of a sudden she's like yeah it doesn't seem fair and then and then you can t now that you've listened to her feelings and restated them and acknowledged them now her mind is open to hearing your feelings. And then you can say, you know how it is for me? I'm, you know, and, and she'll probably say how. And you can say, you know, I'm anxious about getting to the plane on time. I'm, you know, worried about 
you know, being able, you being able to see what you need to pack, which is under some of this stuff and, and not missing something and ending up in Mexico, you know, with things missing. And, and I also want to leave a neat house for the house sitters because it, I just do. <laughs> um, so what should we do? You know, how do you want to do this? You know, should we put a, put out a box that you can throw your toys into? Should we put on music? I'm all about, um, you know, come up, you know, see what she wants to do. See if she comes up with an idea, you know, do you want to put on a favorite song? Do you want to talk? Do you think we should toss the laundry first or, or the toys first? And you can start once you've heard her and she's heard you, you can start moving towards solutions. You don't have to say, well, my kid wants a messy room. So I guess that's what she gets. Um, you can still prefer to leave a clean house for the house sitters and prefer to have some kind of organization. Um, and it's going to take a little more time out of your precious, you know, window where you're trying to get ready for the plane, but then you're going to have a cooperative kid because you listen to her, you acknowledge her feelings. Mm -hmm. You told her your feelings instead of threatening to punish her. And then you help her move on with some choices. Did Tossing write- things is good. Music is good. Um, you know, clean up all the green things first. You know, how do you want to do it? Um, yeah, you I'll- guys could have wrote a book on couples therapy. This is the strategies <laughs> I would say. I'm going to take that home. And when I want to get my husband to do something, I'm going to be like, we're going to do that. I'm going to tell him my feelings. He can share his feelings. And then we collaborate and say, here are some ways maybe. Do you have ideas? I have some ideas. This sounds like it, it's practical across. Oh, and I have to say one more thing about cleaning up because, oh, okay. you know, this is this is a big thing for me. I was also a person who let the kids keep the room however they wanted. But when we had people coming, you know, a bunch of people like, oh, it's going to be Thanksgiving or you have a, uh, for whatever reason, I like the house to be a little bit neat. You know, people are going to come with their own stuff, put it on the counters. People kids want to come play in your room. It's just nicer. Um, so I would, you know, institute these anxiety fueled cleanups. And one of my pitfalls was I would come in and the kid would have done something, you know, like they picked up their dirty clothes and put away the books, but there's still tools and crumpled papers all over the floor and dirt. And, and I would say like, what are you doing sitting in your bed, reading a book? You know, the room is still a mess. Look, you know, you can't walk through here without slicing your foot open. Uh, and that was never helpful because then a kid feels like, well, I made effort and then I got yelled at. So, you know, one of the things we say in our book is describe progress. So if I was mindful enough to think a little bit before I opened my mouth in frustration, I would say, oh, I see you got all the books away and all the laundry in the laundry bin. Now, all that needs to be done is for the tools to go in the tool chest and a little bit of sweeping. And this room will be ready for home beautiful. So if you can describe with pleasure and appreciation what the kid has accomplished, instead of attacking them for not finishing the job, it will give them the oomph to go on and finish the job. Because who among us would appreciate that? You know, if we did a bunch of pots and pans and then, and then your partner comes in and says, this kitchen's still a filthy mess. You know, you have to clear the table, you know, but that would really, I would, I would stomp out. Yeah. I think you get like when you focus on catching them being good. That's like my favorite thing with my kids is you Mm -hmm. catch them being cooperative, catch them putting in an effort. It puts them in that mode to follow your lead because they're saying, oh, like mom or dad notices these things. They appreciate it. And then you're, you're cultivating like those positive habits and kids too, when you're, and they're just more likely to say yes. They're when they're being praised and they're, and you're noticing effort and they feel visible. And when kids feel visible instead of shamed, I think that puts them in a more receptive mode to follow our lead is what I'm hearing when you're giving that kind of feedback. Yeah. Now let's talk about a really specific issue that's, you know, very relevant to today's day and age, which are technology disputes. Mm. Um, I'm guessing like we're, when we're talking our kids, it's, you know, turning off the video games or putting away 
the cell phone or they've had enough iPad time um, and it's time to, to shut that off. And of course, we know with tech, kids escalate very quickly and, oh, just five more minutes or I don't want to turn it off or why can't I be on it for, you know, teenagers want to connect with their friends. What yeah. guidance do you have to parents who are really struggling with that, like getting their kids you know, to turn them off or to get some space away from it. I, I believe you guys, a lot of people praised your book for talking about that. It's a huge challenge for parents. We actually have a chapter in our new book. Is it one chapter or two? Because we, Two chapters. Two chapters. <laughs> um, because we realize it's different depending on the age of the kid. But, you know, we always like to start to think about, okay, what is this issue like for kids? Now think about especially your little kids who they have Play-Doh and they have soccer balls and then they have the iPad. And the, the, the screens are the only toy, the only th object thing that we give to them. And then we say, but don't play it for too long. It's not good for you. We never say, now this Play-Doh is really fun, but don't play it for too long. <laughs> don't play soccer. You're right. <laughs> You're right. right. That's a really good perspective. Because no, I don't ever tell my kids you can't keep making art you can't i mean unless it's dinner time but i don't yeah. put those kind of guidelines on you say it will rot your brains yeah. <laughs> yeah like and it's it's really cool but don't do too much of it yeah so that's really confusing to a kid right they think well i always explore everything else why why not this and it seems really cool you can sit there and it has lights and colors and so many different kinds of games and it's challenging and it's just the right challenge because if it isn't you change it right um so i think that is i think it's it's helpful to remember that that's how a child experiences our our attempts to limit their screen time like it just doesn't seem to make sense to them yeah. right um for younger kids we can actually control their access. And just as the, the other thing that we probably don't give them unlimited access to is like sweets. So I just think it's really helpful to think, uh, to compare what we do with sweets that we don't want them to have too much of and screens. We don't, we, you know, we, we limit their access. Like we don't put a big bowl of chocolates on, the, at least I didn't, but uh, put a big bowl of chocolates on the counter and say, okay, but don't eat these. You can have one. That's it. You know, it, even I would have a hard time if you said, you know, here's the chocolates, don't eat them. Cause then you're like, what are you thinking about all day long? Like, oh, okay, there's a chocolate. Okay. I'm not eating it. I'm eating it. It's really like a lot of effort to not eat it. It's just very tempting. Right? So we have a lot of examples in our book about what parents have done in terms of rules around screen time and how they could get their kids on board with those instead of just making them feeling resentful and like deprived because I want it. Uh, and one of the things I suggest for, for parents of younger kids is to talk about what they can do, not in terms of minutes, because a child doesn't have a strong sense of what's five minutes or 10 minutes. And besides, if they're playing a game or they're watching a video, they want to get to the end. They don't want to play for five minutes. They want to play till it's over. Now, of course, with a video, it's a little bit easier because there is a, an end point. And if you can get in there before the next video comes up, which is, you know, we could discuss about that problem, right? <laughs> They've intentionally created these programs where they immediately see another one. Well, if we can say, we're going to stop at the end and we stop it, that's a lot easier for a kid than saying, well, you have, you're, you have 20 minutes and then that's it. And then you've got a 23 minute video and like, who likes that? Um, so the, the challenge comes with games, which some of which are designed to never end. You know, you get to the to one level and then you want to get to the next level. And I remember when my kids were little, they'd say, but I'll lose my points if I stop in the middle, right? So we can help them find a stopping point rather than just giving them a number of minutes because then they really are stopping, you know, right in the middle of the level or whatever, I, you know. Um, but the other thing that could also help, especially for younger children, is to let them know what's going to come next. Because if you think about the experience of a child on an iPad, doing something really stimulating and interesting, when they turn it off, now you've got a black screen. Now you've got a, a world that's just immobile and plain and boring, right? And they're like, I want to go back on the iPad. That was interesting. So if we say, hey, it's time to go, go outside and 
blow bubbles and see if you can pop them with your nose right? <laughs> or something, something for them to, you know, know like, look forward to, to know what's coming next. That's a lot easier because the transition from playing on the screen to be coming back into, you know, real life, as we say, that can be a tough one. We can help them with that transition. So they have something to look forward to. It's not just a stopping of something fun, but it's a moving on to something else that's fun. Beautiful. Yeah. I think with my kids, they want it. They, it's like, oh, I just need to, I don't know, Minecraft. I need to get the sheep or I need to build this. And it's like, okay, <laughs> well, it's because I know if I let them play all day, they would. Um, but giving them us a little bit of autonomy, like you said, picking an endpoint. I also have my kids set timers and I know that's still time, but they like that where they set it. And then there's, it teaches them a little bit of accountability. Like you set the timer, it goes off and yeah, like it might take a minute or two to finish something up, but they essentially, they know that this is, this is their time. Um, so what essentially what you're doing is you're saying when the timer goes off, you have to find a stopping point and it sounds like they're able to do that without within a minute or two. Well, after some training, <laughs> it didn't right. work, right? It didn't but work also right. what you're doing is something more profound, I think, which is you're putting the child in charge and you're teaching them an important skill, which is how do you manage this, like, frankly, addictive, you know, technology, how, how you know, without an adult hanging over you and saying, you have to stop now, you know, how do you, how do you regulate yourself? How do you take responsibility for it? And when they're setting their own timer and keeping an eye on it and, you know, then maybe going a few minutes over to finish their level, they're in charge. And that's so much them telling themselves what to do is so much better than us telling them what to do on on two levels. One is it's, you know, now it's not a fight for us. And the other is you're really teaching them how to behave in the world because we adults have to grapple with the same problem. I think what the, and I know you talk about this in in your books, is giving kids autonomy and giving them a chance to express their feelings is big. And when kids understand our reasoning, because when they're thinking about like the technology fight, when I was able, like I literally have pictures of brain scans of like what radiation looks like when kids are on a screen. So my kids Hmm. know. I was able to get those from um, from a doctor a matter a number of years ago, and my kids understand why technology is addictive. They understand what cortisol is; it's a stress hormone that we get lots of it when we're on a screen. They understand what dopamine is. So for my kids, it's just like sugar. They understand that the little bugs in their stomach and their microbiome in their stomach—if they eat too much sugar, it makes those like little bugs really unhappy, and then their brains aren't healthy. So I spend time, and I really recommend this to parents as a child psychologist is explain to kids why you have these rules it, and not it be something completely mundane that kids can't relate to. It's like mm. for sugar, it's like you want your body healthy. This is what happens in your gut. And this is why we don't put too much sugar in it because then your brain's not healthy. Like my kids, even at six can understand that. And the same with the tech, they understand like we know this shrinks the brain. It it decreases the mass in your brain. It creates stress hormones. It's addictive. It's similar to how, why adults get addicted to cigarettes. Like we talk about that. And I have found as a parent that is profoundly effective when you can give kids reasons for your rules that they can be like, and we we talk about it. And it's, it's like, cause I want to protect your brain, buddy. Like this is not trying to be the mean mom. I want you to have a healthy brain. And, and you're giving them the information. You're not just giving them reasons. You're giving them information. You're giving them the power to understand it for themselves. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's important is your books talk about dis- it's not just how to order your kids around. That's not what you're implying. You're talking about how to have conversations with our kids and getting them involved in disputes going on. Um, mm-hmm. And I know when we talk about, like in your book, how to talk so little kids will listen. You have these like five concrete steps for um, for when there's disputes. And we were talking earlier about like when my son and daughter get into an argument and I was thinking like how I would implement some of these. Um, you do, you have these five steps. So why don't we like really quickly, like in five minutes, go through this particular one? Because I think it wraps into the, the how we talk to kids and how to walk them through conflict. Um, I better look at the steps. Yeah, I've got the book here too. So, <laughs> um, so we'll say, we'll, and we'll walk. So just so I'll do a quick summary for all our listeners. 
The steps are express your feelings strongly, show your child how to make amends, offer a choice, take action without insult, and then you can move on to problem solving. And then there's five steps to your problem solving as well. So I don't know if these are steps so much as like tools. So there's five tools and there's five steps to your last tool, which is problem solving. Um, so an example of like my son and daughter, uh, maybe they were playing Lego and my son, because he's a bulldozer, like knocks over my daughter's Lego tower. And now Ouch. she is all upset because she works so hard on it. And there's big tears and she yells at him. You're the worst brother in the world. I hate you. We have literally had this conversation in our house. So let's, let's go with that. So when we look at page 132 of your book and we look at some of these tools, why don't you walk through a couple of these or all of them, if we have the time, we'll try to keep it under five minutes. Um, how you would talk to, how I should maybe talk to my kids when that would happen. Big fight, worst brother in the world, Lego tower is destroyed. <sighs> oh, and, and how is and how is your son responding to being called the worst? Is he upset? Or oh, is he... yeah, he loves his sister. And like he didn't, you know, like he would just be like, she's mad at me. And, you know, he would yeah. be, he would not. Yeah, he would feel really yeah. bad. Like he would not know yeah. what to do. He would probably be like. God. He's not the kid who's going to hit. Like, he's not going to be aggressive yeah. that way. I mean, I, I think I would want to start by um, reframing your daughter's insults towards your son as as her strong feelings. And I think those are the biggest feelings going on. So you're going to start with that. And and I'll make up a name. You know, I was like, Rachel, Rachel is really upset. She worked for a half an hour building this tower and use so many tiny little bricks and put them together in careful ways. And with one swipe, it's all over the floor. That was a lot of work. That's so frustrating. So now you're speaking for her and she's going to appreciate that. And then your son gets to hear how she feels without the insults. You know, you're the worst brother ever. Yeah, and, not, and, and not without you're not shaming yeah. him. You're just saying this happened. Yeah. This and happened. You're describing yeah. the scene, and you're also validating her. And feelings. and your daughter might chime in, and she might say, "Yeah, and I, you know, and it wasn't easy to get this and this together, and I was trying to make a that." And and you can just keep acknowledging that. Oh, so you were trying to make that, and you were putting this together, and that was not easy. Um, and then you can say, you know, and Leo you know, wanted to touch it because it was a beautiful building and it, he, you know, didn't mean for it to fall apart. That was not in his plan. And he can, and then maybe your son will say, you know, yeah. what would he say? He'd say, yeah, I just <laughs> wanted to see what it felt like. I didn't know it was going to fall over. I just wanted to fly the spaceship. That's why I threw it. Yeah. Or he'd uh, say it was an, it was an accident and yeah, he would. <laughs> Yeah, he's a little guy who wouldn't knock it over on purpose. Yeah. But and, and so so here now instead of instead of you know have in you're, you're basically modeling for them how they can talk about their feelings to each other without attacking each other with fists or with words. Mm -hmm. So that would be the first step. And then boy, Leo's feeling bad. And Rachel's feeling, I'm making up names yeah. here, angry. Yeah. So how can we, you know, is there any way to fix it? You know, Leo, can you find the little pieces? Where did this go? Um, instead of thinking about punishing the child who did wrong, we always want to think about how can we help this child fix what he did wrong? That's, so the, making, instead that's of, the making amends step. That's the making amends yeah. part. So and instead of feeling bad about himself or resentful, he can start to feel good about himself and reconnect. Right. So would you say when you're using this strategy, would you leave it up to them to come up with a few ideas or would you coach them through and give them the choices? Does that make sense? Like where? Yeah, I think it depends on whether, you know, whether they have the you know, the capacity to come up with an idea. Some little kids need some ideas of, you know, I think, I think what would help right now is see if you can bring all those blocks to all those Lego pieces together. So she can, you know, and ask her if she, if she wants you to help her rebuild it, 
you know, if, if what if he, what if she had gotten knocked <coughs> over and she got hurt? You might say, I think, you know, do you th what do you think will help? Do you think she, she would like a band aid? Would it help to get her a glass of water? My kids always got ice when somebody got hurt. Um, so I think it very much depends on whether they have the ability to come up with an idea or not. If they can, in that moment, think of something. Sometimes when kids are, you know, especially when kids do something that they didn't really anticipate it was going to cause the disruption or the pain that it is, they're sort of frozen in time. Like, I don't know what to do. I didn't mean to do that. I don't know what to do. And if you say, I think she, I think she would really like to have a piece of ice. They're like, oh, okay, ice. I'll go get it. Mm. My kids would I, often get ice. My favorite thing to do is, because I'll say, I can see it was an accident, but your sister's really hurt, um, is to say, how are you going to make this right? Because she's really hurt right now. And I, mm. I love that strategy. Isn't And sometimes they don't know. And they and then they you can just see them there like, I don't know what to do. Like, would you like some ideas of how maybe we can make this right? And, and what I love is you guys are big on choices in your book. So it's giving that autonomy back to them and having them take ownership over the conflict instead of just like, apologize to your sister right now. Like, blah, blah, blah. How dare you do that? You know? Um, which just shuts kids down and kids don't like forced apologies like that. Like it's, it's not, the research would say that's not super effective. It's not satisfying to the person you're apologizing to either <laughs> to hear a forced apology, right? Mm -hmm. That can, that can be irritating. So it's not really helping anybody, but if, if we can find something, as you said, what can we do to make this right? What can we do to make it better? If you can find something that will actually make it better, that's, that's a great first step to making amends. And we notice from talking to a lot of families and in our own families that not only sometimes will kids freeze up, but sometimes they'll run away or even laugh. And, you know, which, which, you know, makes tends to make parents and the injured sibling even more angry because like, wow, you really don't care. But they'll be doing that out of nervousness and fear that everyone's angry at me. And when you give them something to do to make it right and to help, you'll you'll see a very different side of your child. Yeah, these conflicts, this conflict resolution with with my kids anyway, often takes time. Like it's because mm -hmm. one does often runs away and they're in the room crying and they won't let their sibling in. So we can't even do a repair right away. We have mm -hmm. to let the dust settle a little bit. And then we do, you know, I'm with say in this case, it would be my son. And I would say, you know, her feelings are really hurt. She's in her room crying. I wonder how we can make this right. And then he'll because we've co done enough coaching, he has like a menu of things he can mm -hmm. do to make this right. His favorite is to write an apology note to her and like slide it under her door. And again, lots of coaching over the years of what we can do, like when we hurt someone's feelings or, you know, they do something that we don't mean to do. And that always is better than on the moment being like, say, sorry, like it's, it feels inauthentic and it's not received well. Like, because it's coarse. That's like coursing a child to say that. And it's not that we don't encourage in our home apologies, but it should be meaningful. And until you really teach kids how their actions have impacted the other one, and sometimes I would add to that would be, can you think of a time you felt that way? Like you worked really hard on something and someone, it got wrecked. How did that mm. feel? Oh, I felt really sad. And then when you can put them somewhat proverbially in the other child's shoes, then that can help as well. Can you think of a time? And I would just add that if you find that your child isn't ready to do that, if your child isn't ready to say, I think this is how she felt when that happened, it's often because in this case, your son needs some time to process how he feels and needs you to get how he feels first, you know, and if he feels like that wasn't fair, I didn't mean to do that. That was an accident. And then I got yelled at and now I feel bad about myself or shame or whatever it is that feel it can be helpful to start there you didn't want that to happen you were just trying to see how it worked you didn't know it was going to fall apart when you threw it you know anything like that so that he feels understood first and then it'll be easier for him to see it yeah and in this case both kids would have been hurt because he she said some hurtful things to him like you're the worst brother in the world i mm. hate you she's feeling like her space wasn't respected and her things are damaged and so we've got two kids who are hurt now so there's you know a little bit of dance you've got to do with both kids yeah. is and, and that's usually the case with sibling conflict i find there's two kids usually and there's a dance that happens everybody everybody's hurting and if yeah. we want our kids to put themselves in the other person's shoes 
the first thing we have to do is put ourselves in their shoes because that models it for them and allows them to do that. Otherwise they'll be stuck in their, you know, in their own distress. And when you're stuck in your own distress, it's virtually impossible to take the other person's perspective. Yeah. You can't be empathic in that moment because just because we're all, we're so dysregulated. So we're at the end of our podcast. I just wanted to make sure um, people know your work. I have, you're going to have to, I have your one book with me, not the other. So their books are the first, again, hopefully I get it right. The first was how to talk so little kids will listen. What age would you say this is the best for? What? It's it, for ages two to seven. In fact, our subtitle is A Survival Guide to oh, Life there it with is. Children, <laughs> ages two to seven. I have my glasses on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So uh, our second book is How to Talk So, I'm sorry, How to Talk When Kids Won't Listen. And the subtitle of that book is Whining, Fighting, Meltdowns, Defiance, and Other Challenges of Childhood. And that one covers a wider age range. It goes from preschool all the way through, you know, early teens. Awesome. And like I said, anybody listening, their work is really concrete. They have these cool illustrations with like cartoony things and you can think I don't know. To me, it's like actionable steps, which I always so appreciate because when you're in the middle of parenting and you're all stressed out, like you're like, I don't want to read 20 pages to get to one strategy. You're like, I need a tool right now to use. So well, thank uh, you well, for writing a book that is so practical for parents. Yes. Thank books you. Of- let me also mention for people who want to get, want the summary, the real summary version, if you've read our books and you still want to be able to carry the tools around, we have an app that you can put on your phone. <laughs> it's called what? How to Talk Parenting Tips in Your Pocket. And it's available for both iOS and Android. And you can take a look at it for free. I think it's like three ninety nine to buy it. Um, but it, it takes all of the tools and it asks you some questions to quickly get you to the relevant tools that will be helpful. Very cool. Yeah, yeah really like are your kids fighting? Is your kid crying? And then you, you click on that and it's sort of a 20 questions and then it will pop up with, oh. with what tool you can use. All right, I'm downloading that. That sounds amazing. We'll put that as a resource on our website. Uh, Thank you, ladies, so much. Um, Just, we're really excited because Julie, I believe, is speaking at our conference uh, April 21st to 22nd. So you'll go more in depth, like, than... Yes. our time today, which is only about 30, well, I guess we've gone to 40 minutes now. <laughs> Tanya is going to be like 30 minutes and I never can yeah. keep it to 30 minutes. <laughs> Just way too long. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll get to hear more Julie from you then on, are we talk? are you talking about which book are you going to be talking? Speaking well, I'm going to, gonna, I'm going to be talking about the whole concept, how to talk so kids will listen. So I'm going to cover a slightly wider age range, but it's going to be the same tools. But we'll, yeah, we'll go into depth and I'll do some practice exercises with people. Beautiful. I love that. Okay, ladies, thank you again so much for today. Um, it was just just wonderful. You guys have got a great sense of humor. Thank you for dissecting my children for me. I hope that <laughs> <laughs> It's always, you know, it doesn't matter. You know, I've been working with kids for over a decade in therapy and it's different when it's your kids and uh-huh. the kids are melting down, they're fighting and you're I'm in the middle of planning a wedding and I'm stressed out and these things happen. And yep. even the most conscientious, self-aware parents are going to screw up. And I always want to give lots of space for that, that no one does this perfectly. Absolutely. Um, we're all what growing. Dr. Gannat used, my mother's mentor, Dr. Gannat used to say, we aim for 70%, sometimes 50% is all we can manage. And even 10% can make a real difference in a relationship. So, you know, you're not expected to be perfect. <laughs> Beautiful. All right. So I well, I hope everyone gets a chance to look at their app and their two books. And again, ladies, thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you for having us.